Good morning. The Secretary General will uh, preview for you tomorrow's meeting of NATO heads uh, of state and government, and then he'll be very happy to take your questions. Secretary General. Good morning. Uh, tomorrow, heads of state and government in NATO will uh, meet here in Brussels. It will be a short, but it will be an important uh, meeting. It will bring together allied leaders, uh, all allied leaders from uh, all the 28 uh, allied uh, countries, and send a strong message of unity and solidarity. We will mark the handover of our new headquarters from Belgium to NATO with a flag-raising ceremony. Uh, this will be an historic milestone, a new home for a modern uh, alliance. The site where the new headquarters is located was a military airfield during both world wars. And during the construction, we found four unexploded bombs in the ground. So once a place for battle, it will become a venue for dialogue and cooperation uh, between uh, allies. We will also dedicate two uh, memorials at our new headquarters. Chancellor Merkel will dedicate the Berlin Wall Memorial. The segment of the wall represents the victory of freedom over oppression. The freedom that allies continue to preserve every day. And President Trump uh, will dedicate the 9-11 uh, and Article 5 memorial. This fragment of the World Trade Center recalls the first time uh, allies invoked our collective defense clause, symbolizing solidarity and our common fight against terrorism. Terrorists struck uh, again this week in Manchester. This was a barbaric attack which deliberately targeted children young people and their families. Our meeting will show that all NATO allies remain united in the, in the fight against terrorism in all its forms and in defense of our open societies. Countering terrorism is a complex challenge. It requires a coordinated response from our law enforcement agencies, our intelligence services, our judicial systems, and sometimes our military. So it is important that we use all the tools that we have to the full. That is also why one of the two main topics uh, we are going to discuss tomorrow is uh, uh, how NATO can step up its efforts uh, contributing to the fight against terrorism. To deal with the root causes of terrorism, training local forces is one of the best tools that we have. And NATO has the expertise, partnerships and staying power to make a real difference. Today, nearly 13,000 troops from NATO and partner countries contribute to our rescue support mission in Afghanistan training the Afghan forces to secure their country and deny safe haven to international terrorists. But the security situation remains challenging. We have recently completed our regular review of our training mission and our military commanders have asked for a few thousand more troops. We are currently in the process of force generation and I expect final decisions to be taken next month. All NATO allies already contribute to the global coalition to defeat ISIS. And NATO supports the coalition with information collected by our AWACS surveillance aircraft. I expect we will agree to expand our AWACS support for the coalition. This will contribute to airspace management, making the skies safer. I also welcome that several allies have committed air-to-air -air refueling capabilities for NATO AWACS uh, supporting their coalition. 
we are still discussing whether NATO should become a full member of the global uh, coalition. The other major uh, topic for our meeting is burden sharing. This means meeting the pledge we all made in 2014 to stop the cuts, gradually increase and move towards spending 2% of GDP on defense within a decade. And we are making progress. After many years of decline, total defense spending by European allies and Canada rose by billions of dollars last year. But burden sharing is not just about spending, it is also about capabilities and contributions to NATO missions, operations and other engagements. I expect allies will agree to develop national plans and report on them every year. These plans will set out how they intend to meet all three aspects of the pledge, cash, capabilities and contributions. We will decide that allies will share and report on their progress every year. This will be a new tool to ensure we keep up the momentum and live up uh, to our commitments. Prime Minister Markovic of Montenegro will join us tomorrow. The parliaments of 28 allies and Montenegro have now ratified the country's accession to NATO. This is a step forward for Montenegro for stability in the Western Balkans and for our vision of a Europe whole, free and at peace. We look forward to formally welcoming Montenegro as our 29th uh, ally in early June. Tomorrow's meeting will demonstrate NATO's ability to change as the world changes, to keep all our nations safe as we have done since our alliance was founded almost 70 years ago. What we decide tomorrow will build on what we have achieved in recent years. We have turned the decisions we made at Wales and Warsaw summits into reality. Since 2014, we have implemented the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War including tripling the size of uh, the NATO response force to 40,000 troops, with a 5,000 strong spearhead force at its core. Eight new headquarters in the eastern part of the alliance. Four multinational battle groups now deploying to the Baltic states and Poland. An enhanced presence in the Black Sea region. And strengthened cyber defenses. We have also stepped up our cooperation with the European Union. I welcome yesterday's US budget proposal to significantly further increase the US presence in Europe with more troops, infrastructure and exercises. I welcome this strong sign of US continued commitment to NATO and to European security. NATO is adapting to deter any possible aggression and preserve the peace. At the same time, we have delivered on our commitment to dialogue with Russia, with four meetings of the NATO-Russia Council in the last year. So we are delivering on both tracks of defense and dialogue. We have also transformed our approach to fighting terrorism in Afghanistan, we have moved from a combat role to a training role. This has shown us the value of supporting local forces in their fight against terrorism. NATO's strength, strength allows us to defend our nations at home, to train partners abroad, and to engage in difficult but important dialogue. So we have accomplished a lot, and we continue to adapt to the future, this is why, uh, this is what tomorrow's meeting is all about. And with that, I'm ready to take your questions. We'll start with Reuters, third row. Thanks. Thanks, Werner. 
Robin Emmett, Reuters. Uh, Secretary General, given the fact that the 28 allies of NATO are already members of the counter Daesh coalition, why should US President Trump be won over by the decision to join the coalition as NATO? Thank you. NATO plays a role in the fight against terrorism in many different ways. Uh, we are supporting already the uh, global coalition to defeat ISIS. Many allies would like to see NATO as a full member of the coalition for two reasons. Partly because it sends a strong and clear message of unity in the fight against terrorism. And especially in light of the terrorist attacks in Manchester, uh, I think it's important that we send this unified uh, message of uh, that we stand together in the fight against terrorism. But then uh, NATO joining the coalition will also provide a better platform for uh, coordinating the activities of uh, NATO, NATO allies, and other partners in the coalition uh, in the fight against uh, terrorism. So it's partly a political argument, uh, which is uh, presented by many allies, that we will send a strong political message, and partly a practical argument that uh, having NATO uh, being part of the information flows, the meetings, the consultations in the coalition will improve the way we coordinate the uh, uh, efforts uh, of NATO with other NATO allies uh, already being part of the coalition. Uh, lady in the first row, please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Erin McPike um, from Washington, D.C. And on the occasion of President Trump's visit tomorrow. He has not yet publicly backed Article 5. Has he backed it to you privately? Do you expect it to do, him, to do it here tomorrow publicly? And separate from that, we also learned last week that he shared Israeli intelligence with Russian officials in the White House. You'll be discussing increased intelligence sharing tomorrow night. Are you concerned that he will betray any members of the alliance, and do you expect to discuss that with him? Do you expect other heads of state to discuss that with him tomorrow? Will you put controls in place so that he does not betray any members of the alliance? <clears throat> President Trump has clearly stated his strong support to NATO. And uh, the core task of NATO is collective defense. So uh, by expressing strong support to NATO, to our security guarantees, uh, the United States, President Trump, his security team has also, of course, uh, expressed strong support to Article 5 because Article 5, collective defense, is NATO's core task. Uh, and uh, he has stated that publicly, but he also, of course, stated that in meetings with me. Uh, we spoke on the phone after he was elected twice, and then we met also last month in the White House uh, discussing uh, NATO uh, and all uh, uh, the whole NATO agenda. Um, this is not only expressed by him, but is also expressed by the Vice President when he visited uh, uh, NATO, um, Secretary Tillerson, Secretary Mattis, they have all ex expressed in meetings and publicly their strong support to NATO and the security guarantees, which then of course includes collective defense and Article 5. Second, this is a support for collective defense, not only in words, but also in deeds from the United States. Yesterday, the Trump administration presented a budget where they increased funding for U.S. military presence in Europe by 40%, which is a significant increase that comes on top of the increase you saw last year. And that enables an increased military presence of U.S. forces, more exercises, more equipment, more training, more pre-positioned uh, supplies, weapons, ammunition, and uh, more investments in infrastructure. So after many years of uh, a decline in US military presence in Europe, we now uh, see for the first time in many years an increase. So this is a commitment to our collective defense from the United States, not only words, but also in deeds. Uh, so intelligence, oh, sorry. Um, well, intelligence, sharing intelligence is a core activity uh, for NATO. We have, been sh we have shared intelligence for many, many years in this alliance. And actually we are stepping up uh, our sharing of intelligence uh, because we have established a new intelligence division and also expect uh, us to make new decisions on how we can do even more on intelligence uh, in uh, tomorrow when we uh, meet uh, the leaders. 
And of course, I trust all allies uh, that they are able to handle intelligence uh, in a good way. And that's uh, what we have been able to do for many, many, many years. And we will also continue to do that. Wall Street Journal. Mr. Secretary General, um, you mentioned a couple times the budget proposal from the Trump administration. Do you think that in any way lessens the pressure on Europe to spend more on its own defense if the United States is going to provide you know, more troops and, and more deterrence? Uh, and as a related matter, last year you talked about $10 billion in extra funding for, uh, from European allies. What would constitute success in your mind in 2017 and beyond in terms of annual increases in defense spending from Europe? Increased U.S. military presence in Europe does not weaken the need for European allies to invest more in defense. And what we saw last year was that it's not either more U.S. or more Europe. Actually, in 2016, we got, got more of both. In 2016 was the first year of the many years of decline that we saw increased European uh, investment in defense. Uh, but at the same time, we saw increased U.S. presence. So based on what we saw last year, it's absolutely possible to have both more U.S. and more Europe uh, in Europe uh, investing in uh, defense. And... Um, and uh, and um, yeah, so, so, so actually, I, I, there, there's no contradiction. It's not either or, it's both. And we need both. Um, th uh, then, uh, then uh, well, um, we, we, I, we, we publish numbers and figures twice a year in NATO. Uh, in February, in my annual report, we published the estimates for uh, 2016, for defense spending in 2016. And the estimate is uh, 10 billion euro, uh, dollars, uh, euros. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, we will have new figures in uh, June, more uh, so fine figures. Uh, in June, we will also then provide estimates for 2017. I will not give you any specific numbers, uh, and uh, I don't have a clear, or as I say, number which is uh, the difference between success and not success, but I expect the European allies and Canada uh, as, to, as a total to continue uh, uh, to increase in defense spending, moving towards the 2% target. Okay, Washington Post. Hi, Michael Bernbaum from the Washington Post. A, a related question about the U.S. Uh, defense budget. Uh, you have said a succession of U.S. Um, officials have said, Donald Trump has said that uh, the U.S. cannot uh, sort of sustain this, uh, can't hold Europe's uh, defense on its, on its back. Um, and we've heard for years now th this mantra in the United States that the U.S. simply, the U.S. public will not support major uh, defense spending here when allies aren't doing the same thing. Um, uh, to, to follow on Julian's question, it, it does seem like a bit of a contradiction that uh, Trump is, on the one hand, saying the U.S. won't, uh, there's no political will to, to keep spending money on Europe, uh, along with this, this major increase. Are you worried that this is kind of running beyond the political will in the United States, and they're actually could be a, a diminishing of support. This could actually be damaging uh, to, to U.S. support for NATO, given all this talk that we're constantly hearing about uh, declining U.S. willingness, popular willingness to, to, to spend on Europe. So I would have been worried if we saw a decline in European defense spending, but we see the opposite. After many years of decline, we see now an increase. Uh, we turned the corner in 2015, which was the first year of the many years of cuts, that we didn't saw any cuts in European defense spending, actually we saw a small increase. Then in 2016, we saw a significant increase in defense spending in Europe, and I expect defense spending in Europe to continue uh, in 2017, but I don't have uh, any estimates before uh, June. Um, 
Then, on top of increased defence spending in Europe, we also see that European allies are stepping up in uh, other ways by, for instance, being the lead nations for our new Spirit Force. That is something many different European allies have taken on and they are leading the Spirit Force. Uh, and uh, UK and Germany are also lead nations for our enhanced for presence, our battle groups in, in Estonia and, uh, and uh, Lithuania. So European allies are stepping up not only by investing more in defence, but also providing uh, capabilities, uh, uh, contributions to NATO missions and operations and our uh, high readiness and our enhanced uh, presence in the uh, eastern part of uh, the alliance. For me, this is only an additional argument for the US to invest in defence. Uh, and I think by showing that Europeans are stepping up, it's easier to go to the US Congress and ask for more. Uh, and I think actually that's what we have seen uh, this year. Uh, then, uh, uh, then I would also like to say that uh, yesterday I saw a new opinion poll showing that it was a significant increased support for NATO in the United States. So actually the popular support for NATO has increased over the last year in, in, in the United States, something I welcome very much. Which I think it makes it even easier to invest in our alliance. Uh, because this alliance is important both for the United States and for Europe. Al Arabia, second row. Second, Thank you from Larabi News Channel. Mr. Mr. Secretary General, uh, you said um, recently that you are, NATO is not ready to deploy uh, battle uh, forces on the ground in Iraq and uh, Syria. I would like to ask you what is the, um, what will be NATO contribution if you take the decision to augment your role in the fight against uh, Daesh? And uh, so the secondary question, how long will you be supporting uh, Iraq in the training missions. Thank you. <clears throat> there has been no request uh, for any NATO combat role uh, and there is uh, 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 no discussion at all about uh, engaging NATO in a combat role uh, in the counter ISIL uh, uh, coalition. And we have to remember that uh, also out outside the counter ISIL coalition uh, when it comes to what NATO does in Afghanistan, we have ended our combat role. Uh, we don't com conduct combat operations in Afghanistan anymore. We have 13,000 troops in Afghanistan, but what they do is train, assist and advise. Because we strongly believe that in the long run, it is more sustainable that we enable local forces, local governments, local institutions to defend their own country, to fight terrorism themselves, uh, and to stabilize their own countries instead of NATO doing that through big combat operations with big number of combat troops on the ground. So the idea of training is really a main message from NATO because we strongly believe in enabling local forces, local governments to stabilize their own countries. So therefore there is no, it's totally out of question for NATO to engage in any combat operations. Uh, what we are uh, focused on both in Afghanistan and in Iraq and other places is how can we train, uh, assist and advise and that's what we have, uh, uh, that's what we have started to do in Afghanistan uh, uh, no, sorry, in the, what we do in Afghanistan and what we now have started also to do uh, uh, for Iraqi forces first in Jordan now inside Iraq. Uh, there is no um, timetable for how long we will stay but uh, we will assess and uh, see uh, how long that will be needed. Jordania News Agency, third gentleman there. Uh, Zak Shah from Arabs Today. Uh, Secretary General, the war against terrorism started practically seriously in 2001. At that time, Al-Qaeda was in a few mountains in Afghanistan. Now terrorism and extremism is nearly everywhere, at the doorsteps of all of us, and many in the Middle East, saying that the West has failed in taking out the causes and the reasons why these extreme groups and extreme elements are successfully recruiting more uh, terrorists worldwide by not giving like a just solution for just problems like the Arab-Israeli conflict. So many believe that the more the West ignores a serious solution for the Arab-Israeli conflict, the more these extreme elements will take advantage and recruit ignorant and very simple people anywhere uh, all, uh, all around the globe. So do you think that there will be some time soon that a serious decision in trying to take these tools of recruitment from away from these terrorist groups. Thank you. 
I strongly believe that we need uh, many different tools in the fight against terrorism. And uh, one part of the effort to fight terrorism is to address the root causes, the instability, the conflicts, uh, uh, the violence we see uh, in many places in the world, but uh, in the wider Middle East uh, region. And therefore, I support efforts to try to find political solutions, negotiated solutions, to many of the conflicts which are, uh, what should I say, uh, creating the ground uh, for uh, uh, terrorism. Uh, and for instance, in Afghanistan, of course, the aim is to find a political negotiated uh, uh, solution. We also support the efforts to try to find a negotiated solution to the different conflicts we see in the Middle East. Uh, so that's, that's, that's an important part of the efforts to address the terrorist threat. But then sometimes you also need military means, and then uh, NATO has a role to play. And that's what we have done in Afghanistan and uh, elsewhere. So there is no contradiction between either being focused on trying to find political sol solutions and at the same time trying to address the military needs. Tolo TV, first row, yeah. Thank you, Lutfullah Najaf Izara with Tolo News. Mr. Secretary General, what do you expect from uh, an increased, let's say, 5,000 NATO and US troops uh, in Afghanistan while a big surge back in 2009 uh, didn't produce uh, the results expected? <coughs> And now with ISIS, uh, uh, Daesh, very strong in Afghanistan, uh, would it encourage NATO to be involved in some sort of direct combat role uh, against ISIS, given that uh, uh, they are not uh, directly related to uh, ISIS in the Middle East? Uh, some of them are, are local ISIS, either from Afghanistan or Pakistan. And how would you differentiate uh, them with the Taliban? Uh, second question and relates to uh, Russia's report support for the Taliban. Uh, how concerned are you about that? Thank you. The situation now, compared to the surge uh, in Afghanistan uh, some years ago, is very different. Uh, and actually the purpose is totally different. Uh, because at that time, NATO and the United States, uh, also United States being, being part of uh, uh, NATO, but also with their own uh, activities and operations in Afghanistan, um, the, then we were engaged in a big combat operation. Since then, we have been able to build up a strong national Afghan army and security force uh, from almost nothing uh, to uh, now around 350,000 uh, troops and, and policemen. So in 20, at the end of 2014, we handed over the responsibility for the security in Afghanistan to Afghanistan, to, to, to the Afghan uh, National uh, Army and Defense Forces. Uh, and they have proven capable, professional, uh, and they have been able uh, to counter every time uh, Taliban has attacked. And they have proven also able to fight the many different terrorist groups, inclu including ISIS, in Afghanistan. So when there is now a request for a few thousand more troops, it is it's something completely different than the surge back in 2009 and 10. Because then it was a big surge in the combat operation. Now it is a request for a few thousand more troops to do more training. And the aim and capacity building, uh, at least in the NATO framework. And the aim of that is to, for instance, further strengthen the Afghan uh, Special Operation Forces, they are proven extremely uh, important in the fight against Taliban and uh, terrorist groups. Uh, to strengthen the air defenses, no, sorry, the, air, um, the air force of uh, Afghanistan. I met uh, some uh, female uh, so pilots uh, trained by NATO. Uh, so Afghanistan is now developing their, their own air uh, forces. And also some officers and key academies uh, uh, so to, to, to increase command and control. All of this is about enabling Afghanistan, the Afghan uh, security forces, to stabilize their own country. Well, we uh, urge Russia to uh, be part of an Afghan-led uh, peace process. The aim is to uh, reconcile uh, and find a negotiated solution. Uh, uh, and this has to be an Afghan-led uh, 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 peace process. And of course, uh, 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 we uh, have seen reports, but we haven't seen any, what should I say, uh, final proof of uh, 
um, su direct support from Russia to Taliban. So I think we should now focus on how, what, can we do, what can we do to support the peace process, which should be Afghan-led. NPR. Hi, thank you. Terry Schultz with NPR and Deutsche Welle. Um, how do you... Um, how do, you, how do you explain to the allies that are worried about the slippery slope principle when, when the war in Afghanistan started, it also wasn't a NATO-led combat role in, in 2001. By 2003, it was. So you have a perfect example for those who are worried that this is the first step toward a combat role for NATO in counter ISIS uh, operations. And secondly, Juana, don't look at me. Um, secondly, um, how worried are you as the investigation in the United States continues, the investigation into Russian meddling, now not just in the election, but into the inner circle of the Trump administration? Doesn't that affect the credibility of, of operations here when you're working on, on trying to um, affect Russian um, activities? Um, and you have evidence that um, there, there was a significant amount of influence on the Trump administration. Thank you. Allies, all 28 allies decide uh, what NATO does. Uh, and there has been, as I said, no request, no call for a NATO combat role. Uh, actually, I think we have to look, in a way, beyond the combat operation. Because the challenge is that when Mosul is liberated, then we need some forces on the ground to be able to keep the ter territory and to make sure that uh, Iraq becomes a stable uh, country. So I think what we have learned from Iraq, from Afghanistan, from Libya, and many other countries, is that one thing is the military combat operation, but perhaps more demanding in the long run is to stabilize after the combat operations are, have ended. Uh, and that's what NATO is focusing on when we now are engaged in training, uh, assisting, uh, and capacity building in Afghanistan but also focus on that in, uh, in, for instance, Iraq. So again, uh, NATO will only do what the allies want us to do. There has been no call for a combat role. I don't see any need for a combat role, but I see a big need for NATO uh, to do more together with the allies and the coalition to build the capacity which we need in Iraq to be sure that Iraq is a stable country uh, when the uh, combat operations are over and ISIL is uh, uh, defeated. Uh, the other, uh, the, well, the, the, that's a, the dom as a domestic national uh, issue. I'll not uh, go into the U.S. Uh, debate uh, uh, related to Russia uh, and, uh, and the elections. Uh, I will only say that this has in no way affected uh, the work in NATO, uh, the way we work together, uh, all allies, including the United States, here in NATO, and also the way we share intelligence. Uh, Russian media, gentlemen in white shirt. Thank you. Uh, Mikhail Karostik of Russia Commerce and Newspaper. Uh, first question, uh, is there a possibility for a new uh, Russian NATO summit on a ministerial level? And the second, uh, will any new proposals on the eastern flank of NATO be, be discussed on the upcoming summit? What was the uh, annual? Any, any, uh, 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 any, um, is there a possibility that a new uh, Russia NATO uh, meeting will be held on a ministerial level? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, well, we, have a, so we, we never suspended uh, the NATO-Russia Council, and the NATO-Russia NATO Council can meet, uh, can meet on different levels, uh, ambassadorial level, ministerial level, and also at uh, the level of heads of state and government. And I remember when I was Prime Minister in Norway, I participated several times in NATO summits with uh, President Putin, uh, Medvedev, uh, Prime Minister Medvedev, uh, uh, in different formats uh, with them. Uh, so that's something which is still, I should say, uh, possible, but there are no uh, uh, plans to have such a, a meeting. So I think we are now focused on the NATO-Russia Council meetings on the ambassador level, and then we have to come back to, in the future, whether we will then address possible high-level meetings in the uh, Council. And the last question was about... Uh, about will there be any new discussions about the new measures to strengthen the NATO's eastern flank? I, yes, I guess it will be addressed, meaning that I think many NATO allies will uh, uh, welcome uh, the ability of NATO to implement, because I think we are all impressed by the way NATO has been able to adapt 
in a very short period of time to implement the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense since the end of the Cold War, since, and we've done that since 2014. And we have implemented the decisions we made in September 2014 uh, in Wales, and we have implemented the decisions uh, we, have, we made in Warsaw. And we are now deploying the four uh, new uh, battle groups uh, to the Baltic countries and uh, Poland. But I don't expect any requests for any additional measures. Uh, and uh, it is important for NATO to convey the message that we don't see confrontation with Russia. We don't want to provoke a conflict. Actually, our presence there is to prevent the conflict. And what we do is a measured uh, defensive response uh, to uh, what Russia did in uh, Ukraine. No one discussed uh, the idea of having battle groups, NATO forces, in the Baltic countries and Poland before Ukraine. So this is a direct response to uh, Russia's actions in Ukraine. Georgian media here. Georgian Public Broadcast Secretary Van Kardava. Mr. Secretary General, uh, what should Georgia wait for? Um, I mean, uh, tomorrow, can you confirm that leaders will discuss the future of those countries inspiring NATO membership? Uh, and also, will you discuss the open door policy of this organization, uh, Ukraine and Georgia? And also, um, this week, NATO Parliamentary Assembly will visit uh, Georgia. And uh, we want to hear from you the importance uh, of this visit. Thank you very much. I expect several allies uh, or allies to address the importance of our partners, uh, including Georgia. Uh, and Georgia is a key partner for NATO. Uh, we have developed a very close partnership with uh, Georgia and we are implementing the different uh, measures, uh, the substantial package, the training center, more activities, more training and more cooperation with uh, Georgia. I also visited Georgia recently with uh, the North Atlantic Council and the NATO Parliamentary Assembly will visit uh, Georgia in a few uh, days. And uh, I think the Deputy Secretary General will be, will be there uh, together uh, with uh, the parliamentarians. So that just shows in a way how much contacts, how much, how much political dialogue we have with Georgia and also practical uh, uh, support and, uh, and cooperation. And Georgia contributes to NATO with forces in NATO missions and operations, including, for instance, in Afghanistan. And we are very grateful for all the contributions from Georgia uh, to uh, NATO, especially in Afghanistan. Um, uh, yeah. ITN? Also, Open Door. Well, the decisions we made uh, uh, on Open Door still stands, including on uh, what we decided uh, in, 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 in Warsaw on, uh, on Georgia. Um, and I think that this uh, meeting proves that NATO's door is open uh, because at this meeting we will welcome uh, Prime Minister Markovic of Montenegro uh, and, uh, and all parliaments uh, in all 28 allied nations and Montenegro uh, have now ratified the accession treaty so we show that the NATO door is open and we continue to work with uh, Georgia help to implement reforms. ITN, third row. Anna McIntosh from ITN. Um, just regarding the attack in Manchester, um, how much do you expect what happened on Monday night to be a topic of discussion uh, during your talks tomorrow and how much do you think it will influence those talks? Um, and what sort of consequences do you see on the security in Europe as a result of what happened there? The, in, the attacks uh, we saw in Manchester will be something which will be addressed, I think, actually, by all leaders in one way or another. Uh, because the attacks were brutal, and they deliberately targeted children, young people, and families, doing something which should be absolutely safe and secure to attend a concert. And I think people are also impressed, and all NATO leaders are impressed by the way Manchester and the United Kingdom has, have reacted because they, they stand up for their open societies. They don't want to change the way they live because of the terrorist threats. And uh, uh, they prove that they are also not willing to be intimidated and scared by uh, these kind of brutal terrorist attacks. And I know the feeling in the way that back in 2011, uh, Norway suffered a brutal terrorist attack where also many children and young people were killed. 
And uh, it's, it's always meaning less when uh, innocent people are killed, but it's especially brutal when uh, the lives of so young people are cut off uh, in such a brutal way as we saw in uh, Manchester. For me, this just underlines the importance of standing together in the fight against terrorism, uh, recognizing or fully acknowledging that we need many different tools. We need to address the root causes inside our own countries, in NATO allied countries. Uh, we need political means, we need diplomatic means, we need the law enforcement, we need intelligence, but we also need uh, military means, and NATO has a role to play. And I expect NATO allies to step up and agree to do more in the fight against terrorism, not least because of what we saw in Manchester on Monday. Uh, we had uh, Europa Press, lady at the back. Um, thank you, Secretary General. Ana Pisonero, uh, the possibility of having a, a center to fight terrorism, uh, what would it exactly do, and do you, do you expect this to be agreed by leaders? And a second quick, quick, quick question, if I may. Um, what's the time slot uh, that uh, leaders will get for the interventions? Will it be the traditional three minutes, or maybe a bit less? Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, the, uh, we will have a, time, uh, a timer for the different in, in intervention. That's something we always have in NATO, uh, at the different ministerials and different uh, uh, summits. So, so I just underline that to have a timer uh, is a normal thing. Uh, the exact number of minutes, well, uh, I think uh, I have to, to tell that to the heads of state and government first, but it's a, it's, it's a normal procedure uh, we have uh, uh, at this meeting as we have uh, at all our other ministerial meetings. We, are, we have different uh, centers, different centers of excellence uh, addressing uh, uh, fighting terrorism. Uh, we are working also establishing, uh, uh, as a, uh, I know that Spain is now addressing um, uh, what they can do, uh, so uh, uh, we are welcoming all efforts to uh, do more in the fight against the terrorism. Lady in the front here, row here. Ukraine. Uh, the, the question on Ukraine, will uh, the issue of for Minsk agreement implementation be raised at this summit? That's the first question. And the second one, the Ukrainian president has banned the access to the Russian social media in Ukraine. How do you assess this decision and uh, whether you see NATO sees uh, the Russian social media as uh, a weapon in the cyber warfare? I expect uh, several allies, and especially France and Germany being in the Normandy format, uh, to uh, raise and also to brief other allies on the implementation uh, of the Minsk agreements. Uh, we have to uh, remember that the main reason why, or at least one of the main reasons why NATO is implementing the biggest reinforcement of our collective defense and increasing our presence in the eastern part of the lines with the four new battle groups and other measures is because of Ukraine. Uh, so NATO has responded uh, and we support also the uh, economic sanctions of the European Union and the United States uh, and other countries. Uh, we are concerned about the lack of implementation of the Minsk agreements. We have seen uh, many, many violations of the ceasefire, and we have seen that heavy weapons are, are not being redraw, redrawn from the contact line. We are in particular concerned about that the international monitoring mission, the OSE monitors, are not allowed to operate. Uh, and recently we saw that one of them were killed and several were wounded. And this is really hampering the efforts of the OSE to be able to monitor uh, the Minsk agreements, the ceasefire, which is key to the implementation of the Minsk agreements. Uh, I've forgotten social that. Social media, Russian social media, and cyber warfare. Well, we have, we, we see how vulnerable many societies are against, uh, against uh, cyber attacks, and therefore NATO has significantly increased our own cyber defenses. We are also working with partner uh, countries, including Ukraine, on how we can help them to uh, strengthen their cyber uh, networks, uh, cyber defense. 
The Ukrainian government has made clear that uh, this decree to close some of the sites is an issue of security, not uh, one of freedom of uh, speech. And uh, freedom of uh, speech is, uh, is part of the dialogue we have with Ukraine. It's extremely important for NATO. Uh, 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 but it has been clearly uh, stated by the Ukrainian government that this is not about limiting the freedom of speech, but it's something they have done for security uh, uh, reasons. One final question, uh, Romanian media, Adevaru, over there. Christian Montano, Adevaru. Uh, if you remember in uh, Warsaw, uh, you talked a lot about defense and uh, deterring. Uh, and in this context, I want to know What's uh, the stage of the discussion about uh, going on on Rum Romania and Black Sea security uh, problems? Because uh, the Black Sea security is still an open issue. Thank you. Well, we are increasing our uh, presence in the Black Sea uh, region. Uh, we are uh, implementing what we call tailored uh, enhanced forward presence built around a Romanian brigade, but also with contributions from other uh, countries in the region. Uh, we are also increasing our presence, uh, uh, naval presence, and, uh, and uh, also having more uh, uh, presence in the air. I know that the United Kingdom are deploying uh, planes uh, to the region, uh, conducting air policing. So NATO has increased its presence uh, in the Black Sea region, uh, and that is uh, one element of the adaptation of NATO. And again, we, have, we, are, we are delivering. Uh, we have implemented the biggest reinforcement of collective defense, also in the Black Sea region, since the end of the Cold War. Uh, we have, after many years of decline, we have started to increase defense spending. Romania has announced that they will meet the 2% target this year. Latvia and Lithuania have announced that they will meet the 2% target next year. And then we have stepped up our efforts to fight terrorism uh, by being more and more focused on training capacity building. And uh, we have also been able then to deliver on the uh, commitment on dialogue with Russia. So uh, what we do in the Black Sea region is just one of many elements showing that NATO has been really able to respond, to adapt and to change to a new and more demanding security environment. And that's the, that's the reason why NATO is the most successful alliance in history is that we have been able to be united, but at the same time able to change when the world is uh, changing. And that's what we're going to address uh, when we meet uh, tomorrow. Thank you very much. This concludes this press conference. We have a timer on press conferences as well, but we're looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.